All right, hey, what's up, guys? Coach Mac, play fast football. All right, today we're going to do a quick video on some special teams philosophy uh, and then some of the schemes that we use quickly. I'm not going to go into detail about all of them. We can do separate videos on that. But I got uh, one of our followers, Luke, sent me a message, asked me if I could talk a little bit about uh, my special teams philosophy. And then at the same time, uh, if I could go into detail about some of the schemes that we use. So I will talk about uh, each special team scheme that is our base, that what we do. All right, and then maybe we can do some other videos in the future about how we do certain things. So make sure you check out all right, some of our partners, Game Strategy, Sideline Replay System we use all right, here at my school and the schools I've been at in the past. Dome Hats, which is the headwear company we use. This is one of our custom hats right here. All right, Crusaders on the back, fitted. All right, Dome Hat, BK on the front. So make sure you check out Dome. Baker Sporting Goods, the company that we use here. Uh, we use them for uniforms. We use them for spirit packs. We use them for players gear, coaches gear. Fan gear, you can create fan stores where your fans can buy stuff. So make sure you check out Baker Sporting Goods. Just Play Football, best play drawing tool on the market. All right. You can also use it for things like uh, quizzes. You can quiz your player, your, your players on their uh, playbooks and game plans and how much knowledge they have. So you can get a better understanding of the knowledge that they have regarding playbooks and game plans. So make sure you check out Just Play. Difference USA, the ultimate striking machine, get thousands of reps. Without needing a partner, you could use it in season. You could use it in the off season. All right, so it's a great tool. It can be in the weight room. It can be out on the field. If you put a two by four or sink something in the ground, you can put one out there. So make sure you check out Different USA. High and tight ball security training aid we use. Players have to hold the ball in the proper position, proper points of pressure, wrist above the elbow. If they do not have the ball where it belongs or they don't have the proper points of pressure or they don't split the tip, they're not going to hear the auditory beep. All right, so as soon as they hear the beep, they know that they've got the ball held correctly, so you're building that muscle memory. And then stand perfect, which is a training aid we use. Put them down on the ground exactly where you want kids to stand, whether it's an offensive lineman stance, a right foot stagger, a left foot stagger, defensive lineman stance, wide receiver stance. You put them on the ground exactly where you want them. Kids put their feet in them, and now they can feel that's the stance you want. If it's a receiver, you want your feet that wide, narrower, all right, wider that way as far as, all right, east and west, left and right, deeper to narrow as far as front to back. Once they're in the ground, the kids just put their feet in them. You eliminate all the buzzwords. You get more reps because the kids just jump in with their feet where they belong, and you let it rip, all right? So make sure you check out Stand Perfect. Okay, so philosophically speaking, for me, all right, on special teams, I want to be an attacking, aggressive special teams unit that forces the opponent and the coaches that we play against, all right, to defend all three phases of the game. Okay, so we know everybody wants to, you know, spend their time on offense, defense. We know that already. I want to be aggressive and attack to the point where other teams, <clears throat> excuse me, have to prepare for us, all right, as a legit third phase of the game, okay? We have to make teams prepare for us as a legit third phase of the game, all while maximizing the skill potential of my players, right? So I've got to do things within our scheme that maximizes the skill potential of our players. So aggressive attacking, I know those are buzzwords everybody uses, but I want to be aggressive and attacking because I want to make the other teams we play have to work on and practice against and game plan all three phases of the game. Maybe make them put some extra emphasis into the special teams part, which hopefully will take some emphasis away from the offensive defense, offense and defensive part, right? So aggressive, attacking, make teams have to prepare for us, all right, and maximize the skill set of our players, okay? Now, while we're doing that, we also want to make sure that we understand we are trying to make big plays, all right? We're trying to make explosive plays but not at the expense of making huge mistakes, all right? So I don't think it's one of those things that's all or nothing. I don't think it's one of those things that we've got to go out and take all these chances to make big plays, but then make huge mistakes also, all right? So we want to put the emphasis on explosive plays, all right? Momentum changes, but at the same time, we don't want to put that emphasis there where it's all or nothing and we make too many mistakes, okay, in, in, in uh, trying to achieve that goal. For instance. All right, a lot of times if you look back at your kick return numbers, you might have, let's say, eight kick returns that were 30 yards or more. But four of those had penalties on them that knocked you back inside the 10-yard line. Okay, well, yeah, you had eight 30-yard return, 30-plus yard returns, but four of them had penalties. So, you know, in your attacking aggressive mindset to have big-time explosive kick returns, you also did some things within your scheme or how you taught it that led your players to getting penalties. So we want to maximize the skill, but we also want to avoid major mistakes. We want to make big plays, all right? We want to be aggressive, but we also want to avoid making major mistakes that flip the field the other way, 
Okay, so we have to keep those things in mind. At the same time, what we also need to look at is, can we win the hidden yardage battle? All right, so can we win the, the instances where it's, whether it be a fair catch on a punt, a punt that we shank and or we force to shank it out of bounds, a pooch kick on a kickoff that we can place inside the 25 with no return because we can kick it with enough height, a squib kick that we put on the ground that bounces around long enough to where by the time they return it, we can get a coverage unit down there. All right, where are those hidden yardage battles that we can find, okay, that we can win? All right, everybody talks about flip the field. Yes, we get it. Everybody talks about momentum, but finding those little hidden yardage battles, those battles that you can win just by fair catching a ball, okay? Those battles you can win just by being, all right, having a kicker that is good enough to put the ball exactly where you want it with enough height to force a fair catch that puts the ball inside the 30 or inside the 25, all right? Win that hidden yardage battle. Don't give teams extra opportunities. Don't let them flip the field with field position because, all right, you make a mistake either in your scheme or in your execution, okay? So we also want to try and find value, all right, that our players can bring to the team. So it's not necessarily always trying to find that corner, that backup corner, that backup receiver, that backup linebacker, that fourth safety. Doesn't necessarily matter the position. We want to find guys that bring value to the football team because they can be good on special teams. All right, so if you can be good on special teams, you add value to our team, and then we want to make sure that you are appreciated and you understand how much you are appreciated because of the value you are adding to our football team and our football program. All right, so special teams is a great way to find some guys that can add value to what your program is doing that maybe you can't find simply on offense or defense. Now, when push comes to shove, if your best offensive and defensive players are your best special teams players, well, then those other guys are going to have to work harder to add value to the team because we're not just going to play anybody just so we can rest, all right, some of our better players. we got to play the best we can put out there. And when you get on one of those units, all right, you have to understand that you have to execute at a very high level to not hurt the team while you're out there. And if you can do so, then you can add your value to the team. may not be your value as a tailback or your value as a tight end or your value as a as a safety, but you can add your value to the team as a big time special teams player. And we want to make sure that we, all right, encourage that, we reward it, and we make sure that players in that avenue, all right, are, are being valued the same way your big time quarterback is. That's how you get buy in from your players. You spend a lot of time on special teams, you put a lot of effort into special teams, you coach special teams with the same enthusiasm that you do offense and defense, and then you make sure that those special teams guys are rewarded and that they feel value all right in some of the things that they are doing because those things are always going to be very important to make sure that those kids are valued otherwise you're just going to say oh coach you only use me on kickoff I, I don't I never touch the ball I never play receiver I'm just on kickoff make sure they understand how important just being on kickoff is make sure you keep your schemes simple enough that you can be aggressive and you can change the momentum in games but you can maximize the skill potential of your players all right so that's a big one for me you can get, just like offense and defense, you can get sidetracked and go down a rabbit hole of a lot of different special teams, ideas, and schemes, okay? But if it doesn't maximize the skill potential of your players, then I'm not really sure if you should do that, all right? You need to maximize the skill potential of your players, things that they can do and things that they can do repeatedly, regardless of how great you think the scheme is. If they can't do it repeatedly, or if you're changing the scheme so often, that they never get a chance to maximize the skill set that they need, all right, for you to be very successful in that scheme, then it's a waste of time, all right? Make sure it's a scheme that maximizes skill potential, but it's a scheme that they can replicate over and over again the skills needed to be successful within that scheme, and that's very important as well, all right? So I'm just going to cover a couple things here, okay? Punt-wise, we are a shield punt team. We will be two to three foot splits up front. We will normally play with gunners out wide, three guys in a shield with a punt. All right, I'm not going to get, again, I'm not going to get super involved into the mechanics of how we block it, how we teach it, or whatever we're doing, all right, because uh, the video will be too long. I can break that down in a different video. I've done shield punt videos. But here's the reason we are a shield punt team. Because of the time that we have allotted, all right, to, to work on special teams, this gives us the best chance to be solid in protection, and get guys down the field to cover. So obviously we want to take advantage of the rules within the punt game and the fact that our guys can get downfield immediately. 
and we don't have any illegal players downfield in the punt game. We want to take advantage of that. But we also want to take advantage of the fact that we don't get as much time maybe as the college or the NFL punt teams do. Okay, so punt protection is important. A game can really get changed quickly with a blocked punt or a bad snap or a mishandled snap. So we want to make sure that we emphasize how important that is. But within the time that we have allotted, in order for us to be efficient in protection and coverage, I feel like the shield is the best way for us to go. All right. Obviously, if you turn on NFL games, everybody is, is the, the pro punt style. Well, that has a lot to do with the rules. All right. There's still a ton of teams that use shield punts in college. You will see some pro punt teams in college. OK. But at the end of the day, you see more teams in college go to the shield because of the rules, because the pro punt where guys have to sip, seal inside first, and you've got to kick back and be an athlete while sealing inside first and dealing with multiple rushers. That takes a skill set and a physicality and a coordination that a lot of times you may not be able to find in a high school play. Okay, so the shield gives us the ability to be solid in protection, but also get down the field and cover. And then out of the shield, we'll always carry a rugby punt as long as we have a kid that can rugby punt. Some years we've had two punters back there, only two guys in the shield, and we've gone rugby right, rugby left. All right, because the first thing that's going to happen in the shield, guys are going to put four on the shield. As soon as they put four on the shield, double A gap pressure, depending on how you're blocking that with what your rules are, that's where you're going to have issues with the shield. So as soon as you start getting that hard inside, A-gap pressure and things like that, carry a rugby scheme where you can block those things down, put your other guys to the edge, and now it's tough for them to dictate where the launch point of the punt is going to be, so it's harder for them to come after your punts. Okay, so the other day I did a video on, on punt stuff. So if you saw the video on punt stuff, you know punt return, you know that we are going to go after punts. All right, so I believe 90% of the time we are going to try and block punts. All right, so we're always going to have to cover a gunner. All right, there, most of the time we will put a returner back there. There are times we won't put a returner back there. That's just statistics. That's just uh, uh, analytics, numbers, situations in games. But most of the time we're either going to be four and four and aggressively trying to block a punt with – Maybe one guy backing out for, for fakes, maybe one or two guys, maybe somebody's spying a shield, whatever the case may be. But we are creating aggressive looks, either four and four, or maybe some type of stacked five and three look. All right, where we're trying to create an overload and get some, some type of, all right, uh, overload pressure from one side or the other. Okay, or maybe we're creating the overload. All right, and then when we create the overload, possibly we're going to cross, depending on how they protect. If, the set, if we know the center slides, to the overload, and we know that we can send two from out here and get a guy on the shield inside. If the center is going to turn this way, we might bring them across the center's face after the snap, after we create the overload. All right, so there's a bunch of different ways to go after punts. First thing we're always going to look at, what's the operating procedure? What's the snap to foot, the, the time of the operating procedure, okay? Can we get one? All right, if there's a week where their snapper and punter are so good and so quick on the clock that no matter what we do, we're not going to get one. That might be the week that we decide to do more holdup, return type stuff. Usually not going to build a wall into the process because that takes time, effort, teaching. And with my philosophy, I don't think we have enough time and effort to teach a wall return and be effective in what we're doing based on the punters and the snappers that we see. So 90% of the time, you can assume, all right, we are going to cover down eligibles and we are going to go after it with six to seven of the other guys and maybe one or two guys checking fake or one or two guys peeling out. All right. So if I felt like I could draw this, I might have this guy peel out the check fake. And then if we were trying to get, all right, pressure somewhere, I might have that guy peel out for fake. So now we know where we're trying to get pressure. We're trying to get four on the shield from the inside. Either way, you could do it five and three, four and four, create overloads. You can stack guys. So we've stacked guys before where even if it was Four and four, we might stack them behind each other. Okay, that way, and now you can come with all your different, all right, now you can come with all your different games where you're out to in, in, to straight out, or whatever, whatever you want to do, all right? But for us, punt return-wise, we are going to be aggressive. We're going to go after punts. This guy back here is going to understand you're probably going to have to fair catch most of the punts coming to you because I can't protect you, okay? And then if you do field one, if you get a low line drive or something on the ground that you can get your hands on because – we tell this guy back here, everything you can get your hands on, please try and get your hands on. Don't be so aggressive that you run after something, all right, and bobble it. Because for me, as a punt return, kick return unit, the 
the one thing that we're always going to emphasize is we end the down with the football. I don't care what happens now. Those punts that hit the ground and roll for 30 more yards, that's going to kill you in the hidden yardage game. But that will not kill you anywhere near as quick as you muffing a punt and giving the other team the ball back. So when we are on punt return, kick return, goal number one is always going to be end that down with the football. No matter what happens, you end that down with our football. That's the most important thing that we talk about. Okay, so based on down and distance and what we're doing, we've got to talk about angles to the punter. We got to talk about launch points. We got to talk about block points. If the block point is three to four yards ahead of the punter, we got to know where that block point is. We got to talk about guys taking angles to that block point. We got to talk about extending and running through the block point, trying not to leave our feet. Because when you leave your feet, what do you do? You lose body control. When you lose body control, now that might be where we rump the punter, run into the punter. And that aggressive mindset is not worth it to give them the football back, all right, while we're going after punts. So we've got to teach. All right, launch point, where that point's going to be, how to get and bend and lean and get to that point, but also how to extend and try and run through block points and not leave your feet. Yes, I know you see guys in the NFL and college leave their feet, but more often than not, when guys leave their feet, it leads to roughing the kicker, running into the kicker. When you can take at the right angle in front, so if the camera was like a punter and I came in front and I extend and run through the block point, all right, I have a better chance of, if not, Blocking the punt, I have a better chance of just running right by and not running into the punter, and that's always going to be huge because you don't want your aggressive mindset to hurt you in the long run, okay? All right, so kickoff-wise, I am a big fan of four to the boundary side. We would probably kick, depending on if we had a right-footed kicker, we would probably kick from about two to three yards outside the hash, all right? And then to the field side, First thing I'm going to draw up is the stack look. All right, so five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I like to vary the looks on the kickoff unit. If I'm four and six, sometimes I'll stack the guys to the field side. Sometimes I'll stack the guys to the boundary side. Sometimes I'll stack both sides. Sometimes I won't stack either side. So I want to give different looks. Now, the kick or the scheme that you use is going to be based on the kick. So with all that said, if I have a kicker that can do everything I want him to do, all right, we are going to kick deep and try and get touchbacks. We are going to sky to the field. We're going to sky to the boundary. We are going to squib and we are going to onside. All right, we are going to carry every kick that we are physically capable of, of carrying. All right, and then we're going to talk about the angles and the leverage and what we're trying to do to cover those kicks. Right, so to me, it's very, it's very similar to defensive football. All right, we're always going to have, for argument's sake, somebody that's a 21 player, all right, on each side which means 21 players on the field have to be inside of you. You're the only player that is not going to be inside of yourself. All 21 players, 10 of yours and 11 of theirs, need to stay on your inside shoulder pad. They can never get to your outside shoulder pad. If everybody else, all right, let's say, for argument's sake, we're using a two as a pullout, all right, safety, and we're using a nine as a pullout safety, and we're sending five and six and seven, all right, and eight and three, and four, all right, if we're sending those guys as missiles, when they go down the field, they're going to try and keep the ball on their inside shoulder pad. So the ball is, is always going to stay inside of them. So we have to do drills where we teach them how to move as the ball gets returned one way or the other. You can't just be stagnant or static running straight down, all right, the field. As the ball moves, you got to move a little bit. Keep the ball on your inside shoulder pad. We have to teach them how to run by the first level through the speed zone. Run by the first level. Don't look for contact on the first level. It only slows you down. We got to run by in the speed zone. And then when we get eight or less, that's when we're going to have to button, button press. So when that returner is inside of eight, okay, or some people use 10, 12, whatever it may be, all right, eight or less, we're going to button press. That means if that returner is inside eight yards, I now have to take blocks on, but press, find a returner, disengage, and get off. I can no longer avoid, all right, those guys when the ball is inside of eight yards. When the ball is 20 to 30 yards away from me, I can still avoid people. I'll be faster avoiding than I will trying to draw contact. So through that speed zone, when we're trying to avoid some things you got to look at, try to avoid butt side if you can. So when a guy in kick return drops back and turns this way, he's trying to block you that way. Don't avoid to the side that he's trying to block you. Try and avoid butt side. After you avoid, try and get stacked back on your track again. Okay, so you're going to have your 21 players, right? 
So technically, that's really like looking at it and saying, hey, there's a force player. There's a force player, right? So if we have one, two, three, four, five, six missiles going at it, that's like having a six-man box, right? So that's like having a six-man box, four, two, three, three stack, whatever it may be. We got a six-man box, two force players, all right? Here's your secondary contained player. Here's your secondary contained player. Here's that last home run guy that's got to build that safety net in the back so that you've got secondary contained, secondary contained, safety, safety, third level safety there. So when you look at it, it really almost creates like a 4-4, four, four, three deep kind of structure on defense, right? So we are going to spill. We're going to have force here, force here, keep the ball on our inside shoulder pad, all right? So we're kind of, in, in, instead of, Sending the ball, we're going to force the ball back in, and then each one of these players is going to lever or box the ball back inside to a player. All right, so we're always going to try and keep the ball on our inside shoulder pad. All right, and then we're going to make sure that we've got kind of three different levels. So the missiles should always be the deepest down the field. The force guys are the 21 players should be a little bit behind that. And then that last level needs to be a discern. All right, depending on your philosophy or what you want to do, it can be a discerned level of safety kick or safety, or it can be two more levels to where the safeties are a different level. And now the kicker is on a totally different level behind that. All right, that's up. That's completely up to you. But you certainly need to have at least three levels on that return team. Okay, you need to have at least three levels on that return team because if you go down in one level and it breaks, you're done. So you need to have at least three levels on that return team. And I like to try and teach our guys, say, hey, there's our six-man box. You guys in your six-man box are going to try and lever the ball back inside to each other. Force players, all right, are going to turn the ball back inside. We're going to try and keep the ball on our inside shoulder pad. Safety, safety. Kicker as that last, get a guy on the ground, all right, free safety in three deep, middle of the field, however you want to look at it, okay? Big key will be teaching guys do not chase the same color jersey. So if you're off your path of your track and you're running behind the same color jersey, figure it out and fix it. Because chasing your own jersey and kickoff coverage will get you killed real quick. We want to kind of build that flat wall, all right? And we want to keep everything kind of inside and in front if possible, right? So inside and in front is what's best for us. The only other thing I would recommend to you, so if, if you, let's say you're stacked and then next week you're stacked to the boundary. So let's say next week we go one, two, three, four, all right? But then over here, we just go straight across five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The only thing I can say to you, you don't have to change the player doing it, but I would change the alignment where they line up. So if the nine and the two were my safeties, I'm not going to change the player, but each week I'm going to try and line up a little bit different so the two and the nine are not in the same place they were the week before if I can avoid it, all right, because I don't want that other team knowing where my safeties are because once they know where my safeties are, they'll not account for them in their return scheme. And then they'll be able to double my best player or my best gunner, and they'll leave the safety out of the scheme, and that'll be the guy that the returner has to make miss because they know that he's a second or a third level guy because they can see on film where he pulls out. So another thing that you got to do is you got to work really, really hard with the guys, emphasizing how to sprint for 20 yards and then pull yourself out as a safety. All right, maybe not the kicker per se, but those other two safeties, whoever they are, you got to sprint for 20 and then pull yourself out so that as you go down the field on film. You need to look like all the other players through the speed zone. All right. And then hopefully by that time, when you do pull out, the camera has gone back to the returner and the other team, unless they have a, a good wide end zone copy or whatever it is, we don't want them knowing who our safeties are. So we need to change every week. All right. So if you were stacked over there, now next week we're straight across and now we're stacked over here. All right. The following week, we may just be straight across with everybody. But if that, the following week, I, I may go. Five, six, seven, nine, eight, ten. All right. And on this side, I may go one, three, two, four, simply because I want to change where I don't necessarily want to change the kid if he's good at doing it. And if it's the best guy I got to do that, I don't want to change the kid. I want to change up where he lines up so that the other team doesn't understand, all right, exactly where my safety play is. All right. So treat it very similar to defense. Have force players. Have guys in the box that are trying to make plays and keep the ball inside and in front. Secondary contain players, safety net, build that second or third wall, second and third wall, however you want to look at it. All right, with those guys and have some people on different levels. Outside, you got your force players that are your 21 players. Okay. Kick return. I've done a video on this before too. All right, kick return for me. I like to be.
all right? Some version of a 4-2 look, all right? So these six players for me up front are going to be within 15 yards of the ball. So the front four are going to be where they belong at about 11 or 12 or, or never. Obviously, you can't be across the 50. That's a penalty. But our toes are going to be, all right, probably at the 49 or somewhere along those lines, somewhere there. All right. And then those other guys, their toes will probably be at the 46 or the 45 maybe. All right. So it's going to look something like. All right. So you're going to have four, two. And like I said, these guys will all be, if that is, so if they're kicking off from the 40 yard line here, and this is, whoops, all right. Throw as close as I can. If this is the 50, we're going to want that front line as close to the 50 as we can get. And then those other two players that are in those windows there, all right, the two and the five that I've got drawn up here, they're going to be toes at about the, probably the 46, maybe something like that. If they're toes at the 49, they're toes at the 46. All right. And then I'm always going to have a returner on each side that are ready to handle pooches. I'm always going to have one in the middle that's ready to deter those middle squibs or those, all right, even, even maybe sometimes what we'll do is we'll line up the middle guy here so we deter that rushed onside kick, that ambush, that, you know, that everybody in the huddle, kicker comes out, everybody goes, and the kicker falls behind. I feel like because of the rules being changed a couple of years ago, that return style has fallen off the map a little bit, but it's still out there. So sometimes we'll, we'll align that guy there. All right, and then we're always going to have a left returner and a right returner. And the big thing for us is we are a man scheme, and we want to be as, aggr as, as aggressive as we possibly can. Probably going back maybe eight, ten years ago, I stopped trying to find kids that could turn and sprint 20 yards and then locate who they were trying to block. Or guys that had to drop 15 to 20 yards to set a wedge and go, all right, rule changes, other thing changes. But for me, that none of that really had to do anything with rules. What it had to do with was in high school, I found it very hard to get kids to have the skill set to be fast enough to drop and physical enough to block. So what I started doing was I started making these man schemes where the guys on the front line, they're only going to drop five to six yards maximum. And now they're going to turn and find whoever it is they're blocking. So they get five to six maximum to drop. And now they're going to turn and find whoever it is that they have to block. It's an aggressive man scheme. We tell them, hey, you've got two, you've got four, you've got six, you've got seven. We count from left to right, however you want to count it out. You make them count it out and say, all right, look, you got two, you've got three, you've got five, you've got seven, you've got eight. We're going to double whoever. The returner's got nine. However we do it, it ends up being a man scheme, okay? If I put the, the middle wedge player up tight, he's got to make sure the ball is kicked over his head. He will only get about six yards to drop, and he will block a man. Seven and nine have to make sure the ball is kicked over their head and secure. So they might get six to eight, and they're going to be on a man. Six to eight, they're going to be on a man. And whoever doesn't feel the ball is going to lead or double or get our return wherever we need it to be. So occasionally what we'll do is we might double with the eight and the nine on their best player. Okay, but what we don't do is we don't set up right returns. We don't set up left returns. All right, we set up man returns. We try to tell the returner the leverage. So every once in a while, we'll change the leverage and say, hey, we're going to kick everything out. This is going right down the gut. Then we'll change the numbers of, of where everybody's blocking. And we might say, hey, look, this, this return's got a chance to work itself out to the left. I'm going to take these guys, and we're all going to block a number inside of us. So we're going to block everybody in, 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 out, out, out. Okay, and now maybe here whoever doesn't return the ball, all right, would lead us up with the seven. So if we're going to try and block somebody in, and now we might lead it up this way and try and get the return to go back. But the one thing we don't do is we don't set up walls on the left. We don't set up walls on the right. All right. We don't set up wedges. We don't set up. It's a man scheme. We'll try and double their best player or week to week. Okay. And again, the reason for that was I had a hard time finding guys that could drop 18 to 20 yards to block people. We constantly either miss blocks or we had holding penalties or blocks in the back because the guy sprints back to get there. He runs, and when he turns to look, his guy's already by him or going by him, and then he reaches out and does something. So I just had a hard time finding the kids that could do that, and it wasn't really effective for us. So we just went to a man scheme, and we challenged him. We said, look, 
Every week, you've got a man and a return that you've got to block. If your man makes the tackle, you've got 10 up downs on Monday. All right. If your man makes more than one tackle, you've got 20, 30, 40 up downs, whatever it may be. If your man continually makes tackles and you're coming to me every Monday, eventually you've got to get off and we got to get somebody on there that can block somebody. So what we did was we made it. I know all these things with special teams are very, you know, they're about pride. They're about effort. All right. They're about results. So they get a lot of fancy names sometimes and they get either superhero names or they get the pride unit or whatever. Special teams is a really big deal. So what we did is we made this. All right, basically a, a, a back street, all right, or, or, a, or a, a, a back alley basketball game to where we said, look, that's your guy. He can't score a basket. He scores a basket. You've got to, you've got to do up downs, okay? Or we said, hey, that's your buddy. All right, we're all got in a fight somewhere. That's our buddy. It's every man. Take care of your man. Don't let anybody else get to your friends. We just made it a prideful one-on-one -on -one thing, all right? It's you and that guy. That guy cannot make a play. That's the bottom line. So it's easier for us to kind of chart who was making the tackles, who was missing blocks, easier for us to grade the guys to figure out when we needed to make a change. But we really kind of challenged their manhood a little bit and said, listen, this isn't a fancy wedge. You don't have to drop 20 yards. That's your guy. Make sure the ball is kicked over your head. First thing we always talk about, frontline players, ball must be kicked over your head before you drop. I'm not asking you to drop 15, 20 yards. Don't leave early. So when that ball is kicked, there's no need to leave early if I'm only asking you to drop six yards and find your man. By the time that ball is kicked and you know it's going over your head, you should be able to drop six, locate your man, because he's got to sprint, all right, 16 yards to beat you in your six yards. He, he can only get a four-yard head start on you, all right? And even that has changed a little bit, you know, especially when guys can't put their left foot on the white line. They can't be on the 35. They've got to be at least on the 36 or whatever it may be. He's only got four yards, so he's only got those four and another 10. And then the four you drop, so he's got 18 yards. You got to run six. If you can't run six and beat him running 18, we got a problem. So the first thing is you will always see it kicked over your head. The eight will make sure that there's no squibs or outsides ambush. All right, seven and nine are always there to protect skies and pooches because in the high school setting, when guys don't have kickers that can kick the ball deep, trust me, you will see a ton of skies, a ton of pooches. Handle that first. All right, because our number one goal in the return game is the ball always ends in our possession. Punt return, kick return, that down ends with the ball being ours, and that is huge. If we never return one for a touchdown, if we only have two 30-plus explosive plays, all right, but we end every kick return that we're on kick return, every one that season ends in our possession, to me, that is a huge win, all right? Don't give away possessions. Don't let them steal a possession. So if we defend every onside, we defend every pooch kick, and we don't fumble the ball, I don't care if we take any to the house. I don't care how many explosive returns there are. If we do those things in the long run, we're going to win some of that hidden yardage and win that battle because we are not taking, all right, or giving up possessions. And hopefully somewhere along the line on punt return or our kickoff, we've been aggressive enough that we stole a possession from somebody, right? So that's part of being aggressive on kickoff. If I have guys that can pooch and, and sky and onside, I'm going to use those as much as I use the touchback and then I'm going to use my analytics to say, all right, look, when we sky and we give the ball at the 30, what is the percentage of points they're scoring? When we get touchbacks, what's the percentage of points they're scoring? When we try on sides, what's the percentage of points? So when I get those analytics and I study them, I'm now going to know when and where I want to kind of put the pedal to the metal and be aggressive and steal a possession because it's all about trying to steal possessions on special teams. All right, create momentum, flip the field, steal possessions. So on kick return, first and foremost, those front six guys, you do not drop until the ball goes over your head. You will make sure that there are no onsides, no surprise pooch, squibs, or anything like that, because I'm only asking you to drop six yards. Don't run the heck out of there if you don't have to drop 20 yards to find somebody. I'm only asking you to run six yards and find your player, so there's no need to get out of there. So that eliminates that excuse. Seven and nine, the outside guys, you better handle all pooches. I don't care if you have to fair catch it. Catch it and get six yards on your own. Handle a kick. Don't fumble the ball when you're returning it. Those are the only two things we care about. If the ball gets kicked over your head, man on man, block your guy. Make sure your guy doesn't make the tackle. All right. Again, just my philosophy, because in 24 years of kick returns, I've seen it all done. I've seen the fancy returns. I've seen the wedges. I've seen the walls. I've seen the reverses. I've seen the trick. Now, gadgets, I love gadgets. Don't get me wrong. We will throw a gadget in there every once in a while. But as much as I've seen all those things be successful, 
it's not worth it to me. The time and effort that you put into it to get the success isn't worth it to me when we could be spending our time and effort, all right, solidifying the scheme, simplifying the scheme, and then teaching the skills that we need to maximize for that scheme to be effective. So that's, again, these are all my personal deals. These are not systems. I am not saying this is the way to return kicks. I'm not saying that's the way to kick off. I'm not saying that's the way to punt or block points, block punts. I'm saying what I've done over 24 years as a head coach, and a lot of it is based on what I've been hurt by, all right, what I've done successfully, what we have done, all right, in, in as a team and as a unit, what other coaches that coach with me have done. Okay, so when I say I, I mean I as the guy calling the special teams and putting the schemes in. I got beat. Okay, so I learned from that. In a team game, in a coaching world, yes, we got beat. But if I'm the guy putting the scheme in, I take that to heart. If I put a scheme in that our kids can't handle, then I feel like I got to speak. And as a coach, I've always been that way. It's always, I know we always talk about avoid the, the me mentality, the I mentality. It's we over me, right? Well, as a coach, I'm the opposite. As a coach, for me, it's I. All right. When we when something goes wrong, I didn't coach it well enough. All right. Behind closed doors, I'll talk to my coaches about what we need to do better. But when I stand in front of newspapers or I stand in front of booster clubs or I stand in front of principals, I always tell them, look, I did a bad job that week. I didn't do a good enough job of the game plan. I didn't have the team ready. I got out coached. I always put it on me. I never put it on my players. All right. So that's just why I use the word I a lot when I'm coaching. If I'm the, the one that's coordinating it, then I use the word I. OK, now when I talk to the players, it's always about we. This is what we're going to do. This is how we are going to cover. This is how we are going to return. OK, but I for me is when I'm taking the blame on myself because I'm a big fan of falling on your own sword, especially in public, especially in the media. Don't put it on players. Don't put it on assistant coaches. Put it all on yourself. OK, so these are things that I have learned over 24 years of being a head coach because I have been burned by these things, right? So you got to learn, you got to get that charred skin, all right? You got to get chatting a little bit sometimes before you learn. So that's how you learn and you got to grow and you got to improvise. So these are things that I choose to do at the schools. If I have a chance to do it, I would do these things at the schools I'm at because of what I've been through, all right? The other thing I will always do if I have a chance is we will muddle huddle on extra points. All right, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. All right, so we will always muddle huddle on extra points. We will always swing and gate on extra points if I'm in charge. It's something we're always going to do. Why? The other team has to defend it. They have to take time out of their practice to defend it, which means you're taking time that they can't spend extra on defending RPOs or defending read option or defending power or spilling power or defending gap schemes or defending wide zone. You're trying to steal some time from them, or you're trying to make them do other things to prepare. So if you're muddle huddle and, and you can have a couple swinging gate plays and even a couple formations. So I would recommend having two to three swinging gate formations that change every week and you never carry the same one back to back. And then I would recommend two to four at most plays out of each swinging gate scenario that your kids have to understand. And then you rotate them throughout the season. So teams, once they see film, they see three different swinging gate formations and nine different plays. They got to defend all of them and they got to be ready for all of them. So I am always going to be a proponent of some type of swinging gate. Okay. Make them defend it. Put it on film. Okay. So two things to talk about when you say put something on film. First thing is put it on film and make them defend it. So make sure they see your swinging gate. Make sure they see your fake punts. Make sure they see your onside kicks. Because the more they see that, now they have to at least worry about defending it and they have to spend time on defending it. The other thing in special teams, when I say put it on tape, all right, the things we value will show up on, on tape. So if we value kickoff coverage and we value guys running down the field and we value playing in that aggressive attacking mindset, when that other team watches our kickoff unit, they should see that. If they don't, they're seeing something that we allow to happen on the field, which means we really don't value it. Okay, so put it on tape, meaning put your swinging gate out there, put your fake punts out there, put your onside kicks out there and make them see those things because they have to now prepare for it, right? 
but also put it on tape means play with the effort that the other team looks at and goes, hey, special teams is important to these guys. All right, they're swinging gate stuff. They have three different formations. They got three to four plays in each one. They execute at an 80% rate. If we don't get this covered, we're going to give up a point here or there, and they're going to steal a point every time that we can't line up. Okay, so it's about not only trying to steal a point here or there, all right, but it's about making them work harder to defend, making them spend more time, making their defensive coordinator and their defensive coaches and their defensive players be accountable. Because what's the first thing in everybody's mental makeup? When the other team scores a touchdown, the defense is already kind of deflated and dejected. So why not take advantage of that? And if they're kind of beating themselves up and that corner that just got beat, or that backer that just missed the tackle, or that safety that just missed the tackle, or that D lineman that just chased the quarterback sideways and missed the sack, make them run down there and see something that they have to line up against. All right, so mentally make it tough on the players. Schematically make it tough on the coaches and make them defend what you're doing, okay? And then every chance you get to steal a point, steal a point. Now, don't just run a play because you want to show the world what the play is, all right? Just because you practice it doesn't mean you have to run it. If it's there, run it. If it's not, Okay, shift and make sure you understand that when you shift, you just kick normal extra points. There's been some years where teams have lined up and they're, they're so worried about the two point play that we've snapped it and kicked it without even shifting from it because nobody rushed. They all stood back and tried to cover the center and some other things. All right, so we've actually stayed here and snapped it from here and kicked it. So I recommend swinging gate on PATs. I recommend having at least three formations that you can use all year long. I recommend three four plays at the most out of each formation, carry nine to 12 plays in your swinging gate package, put it on film, make them defend it. Okay. So philosophically for me, that is kind of who I am. I want to be aggressive. I want to attack. I want to take advantage. All right. Of the skill set of my players. And I want to make other teams have to work to defend us on special teams. I want the game to be all three phases. In my opinion of doing this for 24 years as a head coach. All right. The easiest way to get a game that is lopsided in talent, all right, you'll always have a better chance, in my opinion, of sneaking some things out in the special teams phase than you will in the offensive defensive phase. Because in my opinion, as a head coach in high school, offensive and defensive phases get this much time, special teams gets this much time. All right, the better programs and the better coaches will make it to where it's closer to balance. It's never going to be balanced just because of the time that we have to prepare. Right, so it's never going to be balanced. The programs that struggle or don't put an emphasis on it or just make it dude for dude. It's OD up here, special teams all the way down here. I think that gap is where we can make a lot of progress. If we've got great kickers, great snappers, and a couple good returners, I think that's where we can schematically make a difference to get that game more in the balance. There's times where you're going to line up on offense and defense and schematically do whatever you want. It's not really going to matter. But I think you can sneak up on some people on special teams. I think special teams in high school is sometimes one of the most overlooked underappreciated, underworked, undervalued part of a game. And I think you can steal a lot of possessions and flip a lot of momentum in a game that you won't be able to do on offense or defense based on the talent. When the talent gets even, that's going to win you or lose you a game, okay? And then when you're supposed to win and the other teams are right, not as talented, that's where you'll find yourself falling in a trap and losing a game with a snap here or there, a bad snap, a bobble snap, a, a punt that gets blocked, field position that gets flipped, momentum that gets changed. Okay, so I think in high school, special teams can really be, all right, a, a, a point or, or, or one of the three phases that can really be a swing point where you can steal a lot of things, all right, from your opponent in special teams, all right? Again, just my opinion. So that is philosophically what I believe in. That is when I am in charge, those are the things, shield punt, aggressively trying to block punts, four and six on kickoff, stack looks straight across, change those looks, change where the safeties line up. Man kick, man kick return schemes, whether it be 6-3-2, 5-3-3, some type of man return scheme where the guys that are blocking don't have to drop very far, and we make it a man-to-man -man assignment, okay, swinging gate in PAT. All right, maybe later on, if you comment or something, we'll go further into the details of how we get certain things done. I do have a kick return video on my channel. I do have <coughs> some uh, shield punt stuff. I, I have some swinging gate stuff. So I've done a little bit of this in smaller videos throughout the eight or nine years that I've been doing these videos, but this was from uh, a, a follower, subscriber, Luke. I appreciate it. I want you guys to know that I read your comments, and if you have a video that I think I can do, I want you to know that I appreciate you as followers. 
I appreciate everything that you do for Play Fast and for me. And I will always try and do something that you guys want because this is all about fans, followers, people out there because you make the channel happen. So hopefully, Luke, I did enough justice to this. If not, ask me a question and I'll answer it whenever I get a chance. All right, hopefully some of you other guys, this helps. If you do something in special teams that you think's cool, shoot it my way. All right, send it out there. All right, in one of the comments or leave it, leave it as a comment. I read all the comments. Remember to turn on that. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, hit that subscription button. Turn the notification bell on so you know every time I do a video or we go on YouTube Live. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Even if you don't like the video, give it a thumbs down. It helps me out. Again, I don't expect everybody to love everything we do. That's why you do it. When you're in this spectrum, you're in the social media world, you're sharing. If people don't like it, give your opinion. That's fine. I'm not going to argue with anybody. That's your opinion. This is my opinion. I appreciate everything you guys do for me. Remember, you won't play well until you play fast. And I will see you guys next time.